The Philadelphia Eagles are in sole possession of first place in the NFC. Green Bay, Atlanta, they lose. And now everybody is drinking the Kool-Aid, including myself. Brennan Albert is here. I'm Adrian FedQ. We're all getting excited. But we're going to get into the film today. The game was on Thursday. We'll get into some Carson Wentz today. We'll get into some Fletcher Cox and deep penetration into the backfield. We'll get into that, too. And the unsung hero of Thursday, Thursday night's game, Nigel Bradham, making plays everywhere on the field. So we'll get into him as well. Uh, so, Brendan, welcome. Uh, another film study. Another one. This, today's a, this one's a really good one. Obviously, this is a really big great away game win which is awesome especially you kind of bit that bullet Thursday night football as we know Thursday night football traditionally is not a great game weird things happen so it's yeah. awesome the Eagles can say hey we played it we played a good team we played on the road we got a win let's keep moving forward obviously the Rodgers injury has a lot of people thinking are the Eagles now the team to beat in the NFC there's obviously still a ton of good teams there in the NFC South the Seahawks, as we know, every single year somehow turn it on late to become a home field advantage team. So great time for us to talk about Eagles. Yeah, I'll definitely be keeping an eye on them, them Seahawks uh, for the rest of the year. That's for sure. They don't look good now, but they always look good by December. So I know how it works. Yep, exactly. Um, but definitely things have definitely opened up. All right, so we're going to get into our first play here. And, you know, uh, as we get oh, set sorry about to that. launch week six. That's what happens when you click on it. But, uh, you know, Car Carson Wentz was really good in this game. Threw three touchdowns. Cam Newton threw three interceptions. So he won the turnover battle. But he did make a mistake on a play in the fourth quarter with a pre-snap read. And we're going to get into that uh, right now. So uh, it was in the fourth quarter. Uh, and, and I'll just kind of get your thoughts, Brent. What did you kind of think of his play overall? Yeah, a really good game. I mean, I, I think, again, we talk about Thursday night games. Weird things happen. Short week. You're playing a good defense. It's not like you're playing the Browns. You know, I mean, the Panthers are a team who two years ago were in the Super Bowl, you know, and, and they also had the MVP, you know, and Cam Newton there. So playing a good defense here. I thought Carson played pretty darn well, all things considered. I'm really liking the way he's developing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. He's, he's throwing three, three, seven. Seven touchdowns in a week, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, I, I was talking about it in my video. You know, you can kind of toss his name into the MVP discussion now. I know it's really, really early, but 13 touchdowns, three interceptions. His ascension has come a lot faster than any of us could have thought. Uh, he's got more potential, I think, now than I thought before. It, it's incredible. But let's, let's get into this play, and, you know, uh, we'll kind of nitpick him a little bit. Uh, I don't even know if this is it. Damn it. It says 243. But it says third and seven. Okay, so I guess this is it. So this is the one. All right, I'll let you get into this. And oh, pause it right to start there, Adrian. I meant, I meant to pause it sooner. It's okay. Don't don't lag on me. Damn it. <laughs> it's all right. So as Adrian kind of gets this set, guys, let me kind of frame it here. So we're third and seven from our own 16-yard line. We're in that situation now where the only thing that really hurts us is a turnover this deep. We can pump the ball and still be in a good good position for our defense, but a turnover here kills us. So we know that, so that in turn means Carolina has to be very aggressive. So with them being very aggressive, this is something I would like to see Carson kind of be a little more aggressive back. Now, everyone, no one's really going to know, except for the guys who were in that locker room, how much freedom does Carson have pre-snap? But let's take a peek here real quick at what we're seeing here. We're seeing an eight-man box with three deep defenders. So three deep defenders being the corner and the top, corner here in the bottom right in the Panthers' mouth, and then the single high safety. So Carson knows, look, they have three deep. They have three deep. This ball has got to come out quick. To me, if Carson has as much freedom at the line, what I would love to see him run is run a out-and-up combination so at the bottom of the screen here. So Adrian, do me a favor and let's circle the bottom receiver we have towards the bottom of the screen for us. Yep, exactly. If Carson has as much freedom as we would hope, I'd love to see Carson check this play into allowing this receiver, we call him the number one receiver, running a go. And then the slot receiver, if you circle him for me, Adrian, yep. run a deep, deep out. And, or I would say even run like a five yard out because if we run a go here, the go is going to run off the corner. 
the out is going to allow our slot receiver to get in space, and then the nearest defender is going to be several yards away from him. Now, obviously, we don't know, again, we don't know how much, you know, pre-snap opportunity Carson has to change play. So let's say he doesn't have any. If he doesn't have any opportunity or doesn't have the ability yet to change play, that's fine. Then he's got two reads he wants to make here. We want to read our tight end. So, Adrian, go ahead and circle our tight end here for us, please, right here. Yep, exactly. And then we, of course, have our slot receiver again, okay? Now, the nearest defender to these guys is number 40. There's no exactly. one here. Exactly. The nearest defender here is 41. So, Adrian, if you want to circle 41 right there outside shade of the tight end, exactly. That should be Carson's read. Carson's read should be if this guy comes and there's no one dropping in the middle of the field, then I'm going to throw it to the slot. If this, if this 41 drops to the slot, I'm going to throw it quick to the linebacker, to the, our tight end here. So as we kind of play this, we get a quick, the, hey, 41's coming. He's coming hot. So Carson should be able to grip this, read it, and now he, instead of come off that read, come off the tight end, Instead of him looking at the middle linebacker, I think his red his read should have been the outside linebacker here because we know the number two receiver is uncovered. Yeah. So it's a mess here on third down. And even even Jeffrey was open on a quick slant too. Uh, so Aguilar was open. Jeffrey was open. This is something he tends to do on third down. He will stare at Ertz and not take his eyes off him. We saw it on the interception we did on the film study last week. Derek Ertz down the entire time on that uh, throw, the, what was it, the, the uh, wheel route from the tight end spot. And he overthrew it, and he was picked off. And, and this is something he tends to do. And uh, Carson was smacking himself in the head after the play. He's like, he saw Nelson. He's like, ah, in my bed. So, all right. Next play we're going to get into, the third and 16 conversion. I, I thought that was – uh, maybe his best throw – well, maybe not his best throw per se, but his best play to be able to hang in the pocket there, step up, take the hit, brace the hit, and, and make that completion. So this is late late in the third quarter. Uh, Matt Collins made more of an impact in this game. I, I, I'll, I'll have to check the snap count, uh, how much he really played. So I know he only had nine snaps the other week, so um, that's not a lot. All right. So this is it right here. Okay, got a third and 16 here. So we know the Panthers. Third and 16, by the way. Third and 16. So we know the Panthers are a team who's very, very aggressive up front and play a lot of man defense behind them. They've always been that way. They haven't changed. Very similar to what we saw with, with uh, the Arizona Cardinals last week. They run very, very similar type of defense. Mm. So now we can kind of take a peek here at the top of the screen. We can see here our slot receiver. He essentially is uncovered. And then we have, and then we have a, you know, a four deep behind it. Okay. Now, as we kind of take a peek at this play, we can see that Carolina is loading up the box. So Ertz here as the attached tight end to the right. Ertz there is go exactly right, Adrian. Ertz is there going to have to stand in and be a protection help. And then Barner, he might have to stay in, stay in too. So we might have to go seven-man protection with this, depending on what we see. So, Adrian, let's go ahead and play this. And what you're going to see in this play is they're going to drop out. So they only rush four. Mm -hmm. Now, what I love here is I love the ability that this ball is going to be ripped right through the middle of the two linebackers. But before that, I love the fact that Carson's able to step up into the pocket, give himself that extra smidget of a second to get down, get, get down the, the field of the ball. Adrian, let's, let's go back. Let's replay this from the beginning. Okay. This is what drives me nuts. It's third and 16. So let's pause it here, Adrian. Because we know that Ertz is going to have to stay in and check and then release, meaning he's going to have to stay, hold his block for a little bit, and then release, it's third and 16. In all likelihood, Zach Ertz, you are not going to get 16 yards down the field and only you have to hold in and block and then release. So because of that, you have some football IQ and stay in there and block the whole darn time. If we play this, 
if you look where the pressure comes from, it comes because Ertz checks him and then tries to release. Well, there's no one else there to help. So this play very realistically should have been a sack. But because Carson does a nice job of stepping up into the pocket, it buys himself that extra smidget of a second to throw the ball down the field. Now, the critical thing Adrian and I, we both said when we won against the Redskins on that big touchdown pass he threw to Nelson, what we didn't love is he spun out and ran backwards to throw the ball down the field. Here, Carson does a much better job of stepping up into the pocket, which is what you should do, and throwing the ball down the field. So this is a great example here of Carson developing week to week. So go ahead, Adrian, and play this full speed. I think you guys will see exactly what I'm talking about when I say my frustration with Zach Ertz and why he should have stayed in and blocked. You're not going to get 16 yards down the field. (laughs) It's it's not going to happen because you are allowing a corner a free rush then. This is a good angle of it too. Look where the pressure is going to come from. It comes from Ertz's man. Everyone else does a great job. Just stay in there, Zach Ertz. Hold, hold your water. Block and allow Carson to throw the ball down the field. Well, our next play is a play later, so it, it actually transitions perfectly. But, uh, you know, I, I'm with you there on, on the Ertz thing. You know, uh, he's had a great year catching the football. I, I do think his run blocking has gotten a little bit better, but pass blocking has always been his kryptonite. He's not good at it. And, you know, there's a perfect example right there. So, uh, Brendan, call it out. Zach Hurts. You're not going to make people in Philly happy, right? Well, here's the way I look at it. I'd rather protect Carson than get a 15-yard completion. Like, even if, even if Carson didn't complete that ball, I'd rather him not complete the ball because he's standing straight up than him not complete it because he's getting knocked on his butt. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. So, this – the next play, so you had a third and 16, then this play, 37-yard completion to all Sean Jeffrey, another perfectly placed deep pass from Wentz. So I don't know how the hell it changed so quickly with the deep pass. But, I mean, we did talk about it, you know, with, with all the mechanical flaws. And, you know, it, maybe it did just take some time to get, get through it. And a, after a month, you know, now we're seeing the last two weeks, he's really hitting this deep ball more consistently. And it's very impressive. Without a question, we're certainly seeing that really come, kind of come along. I think we're also seeing that come along, Adrian, because we're seeing much better internal pocket protection. We're allowing Carson to kind of step up, and Carson's doing a better job of, like, the last play, stepping up into the pocket, stepping up into a throwing lane where he can let his whole body throw through it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. All right, so let's get into this play here. It's going slow. Looks like it. Yep. Let's just look here at this, the, the spot of the ball because, first off, Jeffrey does a great job getting a nice, clean outside release, doesn't get rerouted at all. And Carson puts this ball outside of his shoulder. Yeah. So as we see, he's going to catch it or, or more towards his left hand than his right hand. Safety's got no chance to make a play on the ball. It's just a perfect pass. I mean, this is, this is exactly what we had hoped to see when the, the signing of Alshon Jeffrey. We had hoped to see that the – Accuracy deep down the field improved and has. Fantastic. Now, when we look at the end zone view here, I'm going to show you the unsung hero of this play. All right. Adrian, as soon as the ball is snapped to Carson, do me a favor and pause it for me, please. Yep. Okay. Again, we see a heavy, heavy box. Mm-hmm. Pause it. All right. This, is, this type of protection we're gonna, is called slide man. So slide man is a, this is a front here we're seeing for a seven-man seven man protection. So if we imagine we're Carson Wentz, to our right we have a slide protection. You can see here, look at Kelsey, his, big, his right foot is taking a big long stride into the A gap. Yeah. We see here Brooks taking another slide into the B gap. And then we see obviously our, our big solid, solid right tackle here taking a slide to the right. And then we have the tight end. So everyone to our right is just blocking their gap. So if, for example, Big 98 tries to cut across Brooks' face to his right, Brooks can let that happen because he knows he has Kelsey to help him. Now, where this, the only person who cannot get beat across the face is the center because on the left side, we are man protection. That's what we call it, slide man protection. So we're manned up across the board now. So now on our opposite side, we have our left guard here mined up on 92. Peters is going to be one-on-one with 96. 
So who does this put as the disadvantage? Barner. Barner's going to have to go one-on-one -on -one with the all-pro Thomas Davis, who might be a very well be a Hall of Famer when things are all said and done. And Barner absolutely hands him his lunch. He does a fantastic job of not only blocking Thomas Davis, but making sure he doesn't get driven back into the quarterback's lap. So, Adrian, go ahead and play this full speed, and you'll see how much of an awesome job Barner does here. It's a fantastic job here. I mean, just completely stonewalls him. Yeah. I mean, that's a play that you don't expect your running back to make more often than not. You know, you, you say, you know what, we might lose six of ten of those type of battles of an all-pro versus a guy you signed as a free agent three weeks ago, and he absolutely stonewalled him. So, Barner, tip off the hat, man. Great job there to you. LeGarrette Blunt also had a nice block earlier in the game, but he got flagged for it. He got flagged for pancaking the guy. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't see that one. Yeah, I tweeted about it. They got, they got, uh, they got some play. I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, I would say referees got a um, not as much uh, media attention as they probably wanted. Let's put it that way. From yeah, that yeah. you know, I, I'm the guy that hates playing the ref game, but like this, this was a little bit different. Yeah, this was this was uh, atrocious. But all right, so is this it? Is this yep? This, this is it. Okay. All right, so this is going to be a touchdown pass here to Ertz. So yeah. a couple things I want to talk about. We can see here that Carson knows – he's kind of taking a peek at Ertz. He's seeing the corner is outside shade, meaning the corner is outside shade of Ertz here at the top of the 20. If we kind of take a peek there. So this means that Carson knows that, hey, the only help is going to be of this safety who's spun down at the 10-yard line. So Carson knows, hey, if, if, if Zach is able to get across his face and use his body to position himself, he's going to be able to get open in the middle of the field. So then if that happens, then we got to look at the free high safety, so the guy up at the top of the field. Now what's going to happen with this single high safety all the way up here at the five or the four-yard line yep. is he is going to have to take Alshon over the top. Now, when we look at the bottom two receivers, the bottom two receivers are going to run a follow concept. So these guys are going to run a, a – imagine kind of running right behind each other, which is going to force the linebackers to step up. So what all this is going to do is this is going to force the linebackers to step up. Alshon is going to force the deep safety to run deep. Zach Ertz is going to be able to run right in front of the other safety. So all this is doing is opening the throwing window between the seven-yard line and the goal line. Because the linebackers have to step up, the single high safety has to step back, and now we have that middle of the field open that all we're saying is as long as Zach Ertz doesn't get rerouted and can get across the face of the safety, we have a great throwing window for a touchdown. So, Adrian, let's play this. And the ball on this play, the ball placement, only awesome. where Zach Ertz can catch it. Perfect. Yep, awesome trajectory here. And that's, and that's exactly what I was talking about because the linebackers are going to have to step up for our bottom two receivers, and then the single high safety, he's going to have to drop because Alshon is going to get so so deep so quick. Come on, baby, make it hurt so good. Right there, right? So we see here, if we look, pause it, Adrian. We see how both the linebackers are now stepping up. They're okay. Both the linebackers saw, took a peek at those incoming receivers, took the step up. And now that throwing window is perfect. We can see here that, again, Carson's got a clean pocket that he's able to step up. And as I talked about it last week, the prettiest thing in the world when the quarterback's able to take his mouthpiece out before the ball is even completed because he wants to celebrate. Yeah. Does a great job here of trajectory of the ball over the linebacker. We see here Ertz is already walled off the safety. Top safety, he has he's nowhere near. First off, before we before I talk any further, Carolina has one of the worst safety tandems in the NFL. Yes. And they do a great job attacking the middle of the field on them. And this is just a, a perfect touchdown here. Yeah, I, I talked about that before the game. They're secondary. You could definitely pick on them. Definitely yeah, especially the safeties. Especially yeah. the safeties. They're very, very poor safeties. I mean, Roman Harper and Kurt Coleman were their starting safeties forever, and that's not exactly an elite tandem in the NFL. And I, I think Coleman is still hurt, I believe. So they started – they have Colin Jones and Mike Adams, I believe, yep. are their starters. And what that's – it's not good. It's not good. No, no. You know, because uh, cause, uh, some people are like, well, the Eagles don't have a great secondary either. I'm like, well, at least the Eagles have safeties. Well, the Panthers don't have them. Yep, I agree. All right. Now we're going to get into some defense and some deep penetration. 
I explained earlier, some brutal penetration from Fletcher Cox. And uh, I don't know where the place went. All right. I'm going to have to restart this. I don't know what happened there. Did we get set? All right. And now they're back. The plays are back. So Fletcher Cox was, was a man based in this game. Uh, he, he, he was, I guess they, they announced he was active about an hour or two before the game. And he was just making mincemeat of Trey Turner all night. Uh, we'll get into the interception first. So we'll, we'll get into that play where, I mean, he, he's just bull rushing Trey Turner to death. And he had no shot. Yeah, Trey Turner was put on ice skates more, more often than you would like. Yeah. You would have thought he was like in a Winter Olympics. And that's the other big weakness we have here in Carolina is the offensive line is not very good. Yeah. Very good offensive line. It's not very good defensive backs. This is an awesome opportunity here for Fletcher Cox to get put one-on-one -on -one here. And more often than not, Fletcher Cox is going to win. Now, I understand that, you know, Cam Newton did throw three interceptions. So that's obviously a great sign for your defense. But – Two of the interceptions I won't say on Cam. This one I won't completely fault on Cam because he's got nowhere to step up into the pocket. I mean, he's just absolutely trying to throw this ball off his back foot. Cam is a guy, to be fair, that likes to force the ball down the field, and this is a great example where he should have just taken the sack. Yeah. But this one I don't blame completely on Cam. The other one that was, you know, Jonathan Stewart where it bounced off him and uh, I forget who, one of the corners. Yeah, Patrick Robinson, yeah. Patrick Robinson, yeah, I'm with Mm -hmm. and, this, and this is what's going to get Fletcher Cox one-on-one, -on -one, is, that light, is that threat here to the center. Center now has okay. to think, okay, or maybe I have to take one one-on-one. -on -one. So now he's going to peek inside, and now that allows Fletcher enough time to get one-on-one. -on -one and see you later, Trey Turner. You're now going to be used as a domino for me to throw right into Cam. Cox up in Cam's face. Yep. There you go. And throw a little, little batted ball up there. Bingo, 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 and we're able to make something happy. Eagles offense gets short field. And that's a ball that should be caught by, what, 90% of corners right there? Absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, I heard people say, well, Rasul Douglas' ball skills. I'm like, well, everyone, any corner could have caught that. I don't, I don't want to hear that about ball schools. I mean, <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're a defensive, defensive player, when you pray to God at night for easy plays, that's the plays you pray for that a ball to get flicked imp in the air and you're the only one near it. I mean, don't, don't tell me this is a ball skill play. This is just the ability of an NFL player to be able to catch a football. I get that Rasul Douglas had eight interceptions last year. And, yes, his ball skills are pretty good, but this wasn't a play where he showcased them. This no, is just – That's, that's it, free money. Pass, it was an easy interception. Fucking Brendan and I could have kicked down with it. It's free money. No, nothing for me to get too excited about. It's a great job of him being Johnny on the spot. Yeah. It goes more to Fletcher Cox than it goes to Robinson. Absolutely. It's about the brutal and merciless penetration in Cam's face. All right, so another play where he completely bulldozes Turner. And, and I, I love the start of the second half and just this whole defensive sequence. Uh, Vinnie Curry had just made a play and run defensive play prior. This was the start of the second half. This is a second and 12. Uh, this is the play right before the Patrick Robinson pick. So uh, this is a play where Cox gets penetration again. We see the same kind of bull rush move, completely bulldozes Turner. And it forces Newton a little bit to his left, maneuvers a little bit. And, and that's why I want to get into this play and uh, you kind of talk about, you know, what it means to kind of cause that type of disruption as the defensive tackle. There's three quarterbacks in the NFL who, in my opinion, have the livest live arms that you can kind of – get away with having really poor lower body mechanics. Cam Newton, Stafford, and Rivers. Those are the three guys who can, who can kind of get away with their feet not always being set underneath because their arms are just so freaking talented. So they're able to make some of these throws. The other problems you have with all three of those guys, all three of those guys know that, and they're going to try to gun the ball into windows that they probably shouldn't. So if we kind of take a peek here, Fletcher's going to do a great job at really forcing internal pressure there to ensure that Cam doesn't have a clean pocket to step up into. And then again, because Cam's one of those guys who doesn't do a great job at resetting his feet and then throwing the ball down the field, he's going to try to do too much of his upper body here. Yep. 
All right, so we'll just kind of play it through. Yep. Hopefully it goes slow. All right. So we basically just see the same thing we just saw with the bull rush and Cox just overwhelming Turner. Just yeah. What confused me was that Carolina, for some reason, continued to have their center go left. Yeah. I just know. Yeah. Why, why are they leaving him one-on-one? On one? Especially because in this situation, you had Ed Dixon there as a tight end also inside. So you were four on two to the left and then you were two on two to the right. I didn't really understand that, but I mean, Look, if, it's, if, if they're not fixing anything, then as the Eagles defensive staff, you're going to say, okay, we're just going to keep <laughs> who we want. You want to give us an all-pro one-on-one? Yeah, we'll take that money every single day. Yeah. And I, I, these angles are always better, obviously, for the pass rush and you know, watching the offensive line. And, again, yeah. you see, what, why is he – Check into our line. I'm here. Like – you have Fletcher Cox, an all pro. Especially the right, tackle. the right tackle. What are you doing? I mean, I mean, really, what, what are you doing? Are you just waiting for Brandon Graham, who has shown that he's dropping into space for a delay? Okay. If that's, that's, that makes sense, at least use your left hand to at least feel and help with the internal pressure there. And then you can at least feel that if Fletcher really starts to get him beat. Again, Offensive line, very, very poor here for Carolina. Safeties, very, very poor here for Carolina. So Philadelphia is like, look, you want to give us Fletcher Cox one-on-one all game, we will rock your world, Cam. We will absolutely rock your world. And that's what he did. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you saw the ball placement was off, and that's due to Cox's pressure having Cam to reset his feet. And, obviously, we saw what happened there. An inaccurate throw and an incompletion. And then a play later, it was an interception by Patrick Robinson, Eagles took over the game. Another unsung hero in this game, well, the unsung hero in this game, Nigel Bradham. Uh, he's been underrated here in Philadelphia, I think, but this was the game where he really stood out and you know, made a lot of pass deflections and zone coverage. And then, But I like this play here. Uh, so we have a third and goal at the five-yard line, I believe, and he makes a tackle on Christian McCaffrey uh, short of the goal line. And Christian McCaffrey is pretty damn elusive for a white boy. So I, I thought this play was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, what did you think, uh, Brennan, as, a, I, as I get into that? Without a question, when we get into the goal line or short yardage, the biggest thing that offenses are going to try to do is they're going to try to put receivers right on top of each other. So we're going to see a lot of tight bunch formation. And what that naturally does the defense, it naturally means, okay, we're going to respond with tight bunch to defense. Now pause it here, Adrian. We can see a lot of communication. And the biggest thing that Nigel is saying is we cannot be on the same level. The same level means the safety in the corner cannot be on the same yard line because what's going to happen in a short yarded situation, receivers are going to cross. And if we line up pre-snap on the same yard line, we're running right into each other every single time. So we talk about pick plays all the time. So Nigel here is saying one of you guys has to get your ass down in the box, because if we're all lined up, we are all going to run into each other, and then we're going to be on an episode of Come On, Man on, on ESPN. <laughs> so as you watch this play here, you'll see Nigel is just barking. And I love this. As a linebacker, as an, a linebacker, they set the defense. They can be wrong, but if they're wrong, everyone has to be wrong together. So if they say, hey, we're going to cover two, and you know it's you know a, a clear play where they're going to run verticals on you, you can be wrong, but that's what the linebacker says. You have to do it. So I love here the fact that Nigel is saying, I don't care what you guys are saying. You can read it. You can look at his sign language. He's not backing down to anyone. He's telling guys this is the formation we are going to get in. So go ahead, Adrian, and play this. And you'll see eventually that the safety says, oh, okay, okay, Nigel, you're right. You're right. <laughs> He's coming hard off the edge here. And as you see Nigel, he's starting to get a little depth. We can see here, hey, he's not on the same level as the corner intentionally for a reason because now he's able to run right behind his tail to get over the top to get to Christian McCaffrey. If they were all lined up on the same level, this is easy money touchdown, especially when you have a great receiver out of the backfield like Christian McCaffrey. You're going to try to run everything in bunch as much as possible to try to get defensive players all to be on the same level to get them to run into each other. Because more often than not, when these type of big plays happen, 
it's usually because the defensive guys run into each other right off the jump. And look at him bark. I love it. Yep. And Get it, your ass down there. It seems so small, but this half yard he steps right now behind our defensive back is the yard that he needs to run right over the top of Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, that allows him the room free there to mm-hmm. make that play. And it makes a ton of sense, too, because if he lines up a yard in front, that's one yard less of an angle, and that one yard less now gives him less opportunity to use his lack of speed in comparison to Christian McCaffrey's speed ability because obviously McCaffrey is going to outrun him more often than not so Mm -hmm. Nigel knows I got to get a good angle that's why he has to take the step back yeah I was about to say that he took a perfect angle there that the fact that McCaffrey had no cutback lane on that couldn't cut back against Bradham wow impressive so there you go those are our plays today there's only seven of them so sorry if you guys are disappointed but there you go um that's the game uh what, what did you think overall you know, what were your thoughts on it, all everything? I mean, uh, let me kind of take a step from the Panthers' perspective first, then we'll talk Eagles. Yeah. Panthers' perspectives, the problems that we thought preseason, Adrian, and, and everyone, you guys can go back and check me and Adrian's team-by-team team preview. We did all 32 teams. We said the offensive line was a massive problem. We said the yep. defensive backs was a massive problem. Yep. We still know those are massive problems there in Carolina. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the, uh, the good news. Their weaknesses are still their weaknesses. I don't think they're going to be able to solve their, their problems between today and next and you know, the end of the season. So if Eagles play them in the playoffs, whatever, wild card, et cetera, that's good. The flip side's here. Let's play worst-case scenario. I don't think this is going to happen the way the season is projected. Worst-case scenario, somehow Dallas or Washington wins the division, and now Philadelphia is in the wild card hunt. Well, they hunt the tie break now here with Carolina. So that's a really big factor. I still don't think – I think the Eagles will win the division – but that's nice to know we have that tiebreaker. On the Eagles front, Carson is developing week by week, which is awesome to see. Running backs are producing enough to win games, not enough to blow us out, but doing enough. Defensive backs have looked fantastic. So that's a massive, massive boost. Defensive backs have looked really good. Front four is getting a lot of pressure. Defense is looking fantastic as well. Very, very close to being a Super Bowl contender. The only reason I'm saying we're not – is I still want to see him play Dallas. I still want to see that you know what happens when we play Dallas because on paper right now, especially with the Zeke suspension, Eagles are a better team. But to me, you're not a better team until you can beat the other team. It's just simple as it is. So I think Eagles are in the right direction. Super Bowl contender, not there yet. We're moving in the right direction. Certainly a top four team in the NFC. Dude, I, I, things are just opening up for them. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, even if you look at the schedule, Next three games are at home before you have a bye, and then you play Dallas, which might not even have Zeke. Yep. So you're looking at things really, really opening up up here for the Eagles. And, you know, it, this schedule looks so tough preseason. Now all of a sudden it's, it's looking really easy because Oakland isn't playing as well as you would have expected. Manuel uh, Sanders got hurt last night. Yeah. And then, and then even, uh, you know, going to Seattle doesn't look as daunting either. Like how good are they going to be? Mm-hmm. So – I feel like there's there's a combination of two. Obviously, the Eagles are, are looking very good. But the NFC as a whole is not the conference that I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. They don't look good. I don't think the conference looks that good. Who, who really is, besides the Eagles right now, well, obviously, the Eagles are record-wise top team in the NFC. I hate saying it because I don't want to jinx anything. Exactly. That's where I'm, I'm at too, Adrian. I don't want to praise them too much right now because I'm afraid of jinxing it. All right, I'll ask you this since you're a coach. All right? Everyone's because I talked about this in a, in a Twitter video yesterday. So you have a situation here where five days ago you were playing the underdog role. You were the hunter. Now all of a sudden you're getting all this praise. You're talked about being a Super Bowl contender. Carson Wentz is being mentioned MVP consideration. How do you handle that now as a team, as a coach? You know, like you you gotta the narrative has changed. Personally, for me, it doesn't change a single thing. Yeah. And, and, I mean, my mindset is I don't care if I'm the hunted or the hunter. My goal every single week is to win the game. So it doesn't change my goal. So if, it, if it's not changing my goal, it shouldn't change the way I coach. It shouldn't change the way our team prepares. We need to go out there and just execute. And I don't think it really changes that much. Maybe for younger players. I'm just, I'm just hoping they don't start looking ahead because they're seeing what might happen. That's possible. 
I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think you're wrong, Adrian, in that potentially could happen, but I wouldn't change my narrative at all. No. Now, I would think, as an NFL team, they are taught how to deal with these distractions, I would think, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, every NFL team has a leadership or mental conditioning coach whose whole job is to help, help guys mentally prepare, go one game at a time and things like that. So every NFL team and every NFL player is exposed to that type of training. There you go. All right. That's Brendan. I'm Adrian. I'll let you get back to work. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> Take care, guys. See you, guys.